Good day, this is Shauna Casey, and welcome to this SOS educational webcast, No More Proxy Woes, Executive Compensation Disclosures Within the Proxy Statement Debunked. Due to the large number of attendees, no conference call service is available for this webcast. The sound will broadcast through your computer speakers. However, if you wish to ask a question at any time during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions and answers panel of your GoTo webcast console, and we will do our best to answer them as they come in. Any questions that we don't get a chance to address during the webcast, we will follow up with afterwards via email. This morning we sent an email with a link to the presentation materials to everyone that registered as of 10 a.m. Pacific this morning. You can also find the link to the materials under the Event Resources tab on your GoTo webcast console. This session will also be recorded, and we will send a link to the recording and materials in the next day or two. I hope that all of you are familiar with Stock and Options Solutions, or SOS as we are more commonly known. For those of you who are not, SOS is the only true outsourcing firm within the equity compensation marketplace. We deliver a team-based approach to filling the seat in your equity compensation department. To learn more, you can visit us online at www.sos-team.com or call us at 408-979-8700. Next, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today's session. We are pleased to have Mo Zoni of SOS and Sven Skillred of TransUnion on the panel today. Next is our standard disclaimer slide. We'd like to remind you to consult your own advisors before making any changes. As I mentioned, the materials are available on our website, and here again is the link. Thank you all for joining us today, and with that, I'll turn this presentation over to Mo, who will introduce our topic and cover the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Shana, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We're excited to be presenting to you. Um, as you know, we're going over the proxy statement, specifically the executive compensation uh, tabular disclosures. Uh, this is intended to be a very high-level overview. Um, I think if we got into every rule, it would just take probably a week for us to explain it all. So, um, and it also, uh, it's primarily focused on stock plan professionals. Um, so, we really just, I, I'm having been in the industry for, for 12 years, we're just really trying to put my seat, uh, put myself in the stock plan seat and think about what tips um, can be most helpful to people administering equity plans and preparing the proxy statement. So we'll begin um, today by going over uh, the executive, uh, providing a brief overview of the executive compensation disclosures. And then we will define um, the named executive officer and discuss how to determine named executive officers uh, for inclusion in the proxy statement. Then we'll go over the various tabular executive compensation disclosures um, and uh, we'll uh, provide a timeline uh, to help mitigate the glut because it is a lot of work to uh, compile data and draft the tables and the footnotes and lastly we'll provide some excellent resources that uh, we find helpful and, and we think you'll also find helpful and with that i'll um, turn over our the uh, presentation to Sven, who will go over the executive compensation disclosures brief overview. Thanks, Mel. Uh, just to level set a little bit, we thought it would be helpful to put some perspective in terms of where the rules came from, why they're there, and how they've evolved over the course of the last uh, 12 years or so. So just to level set, the executive compensation disclosures in their current state um, were initially effective back in November of 2006. Just as a little, a little bit of background, the last time the FCC had revised these rules, it was in the early 1990s, um, so they were due for an update. Then there were amendments in December of 2006 and again in December of 2009 to alter the reporting of equity awards. If you remember, there was some questions regarding 
whether to disclose the grant fee fair value or how, how is that going to look. Um, so those amendments clarified and got us to our current state. And then in 2011, there was a, the addition of the various requirements under the Dodd-Frank Act. Dodd-Frank really created the concept of stay on pay. Uh, and just a reminder, the SEC continues to be very, very interested in the executive compensation disclosures. For the first time in recent history, the SEC actually issued an enforcement order against the Dow Chemical Company for its uh, perquisite disclosure, or really the lack thereof. And it was interesting because in the enforcement order, not only did they find the Dow Chemical Company, but they put in additional requirements regarding education for those who are preparing the proxy statement, uh, in addition to requiring the organization to hire some consultants. Um, so this is kind of where we are for the rules now. Um, there are still a couple of items that are tangentially related to the proxy statement disclosures that are still proposed under Dodd-Frank, in, in particular the pay for performance disclosure, which you know we won't get into today, but I do want to highlight. And then the second item is the uh, the clawbacks, which there's proposed rules out there, I believe, but we, we don't know, you know the, when the exchanges are going to adopt them or if that's going to become reality. And given the current administration, um, you know, nobody knows where this stuff is going to go. Um, so to, to kick it off, I'm going to turn it over to Mo on determining the named executive officers. Thank you, Sven. Um, so, uh, Sometimes stock plan professionals are only asked to provide data um, for the proxy tables. Um, in other cases, uh, they'll be asked to actually determine the named executive officers, which is quite a feat. So uh, we're including um, some, some tips here and, and some uh, advice, hope, hoping to make this process easier for you if you are responsible for making any ill determinations. So, First, we'll define named executive officer. Um, it's anyone serving as the principal executive officer, such as the CEO, during the fiscal year, regardless of compensation. Uh, so if, if someone served as CEO and resigned midway through the year, and then you have um, someone who took their place and is serving as uh, the new CEO, you, will, you would include both those people in the proxy um, statement. Also, anyone serving as the principal financial officer um, during the year would be included as an NEL. After that point, it gets a little fuzzy. Um, so you would take the uh, company's three other highest paid executive officers um, with a minimum of 100K of compensation the fiscal year. And, and those would be included in uh, the proxy statement. Up to, and then up to a, two additional individuals who compens whose compensation would have qualified them as NEOs had they, had they been uh, executive officers during the fiscal year, those would also be included. Um, hey Mo, just on that last point, I think it's important for people to realize that you, usually the the two additional individuals who comp whose compensation would have qualified them as NEOs, you know, had they been executive officers, I just think it's important that it's not just an termination of employment scenario where that can come into play. Um, if for whatever reason you have a change in executive officer determination, then you should still look at this. Um, my experience has been when we, when we, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but my experience has been we typically look at everybody um, who's an executive officer at all during the calendar year, and then that's really your list for, for the year. And you, you know, you, you start to forecast or model um, beyond just the CEO, CFO, and the top three. You should probably include uh, really anybody who's an executive officer. So I think it's important that people realize that that can catch you off guard or can sneak up on you, but be aware of it. Agreed, thank you, Sven. Um, now, um, the, the definition of compensation is um, quite broad, and, and so we're just gonna briefly go over that as well. So, The way we the the way compensation is defined happens to be um, the same way as defined for the summary compensation table, which is very convenient because 
you only really have to learn one set of rules. And uh, if you've ever been in charge in the summary of the summary comp table, um, you could then apply those rules also to the NEO determination. The uh, summary comp table includes various compensation components such as base salary, bonus, equity awards, and perquisites. Um, perquisites um, in, include uh, 401k matching, relocation benefits, um, housing allowances, uh, personal use of company property such as a company car, and um, and those could be quite difficult to quantify and uh, and so you know much care is needed to um, have receipts and and other um, documentation behind your analysis. Now tracking all those various compensation components for every individual, let's say top 20 or top 30 uh, in your company, can be a, da a daunting task. And so uh, we suggest the following. Uh, we should begin with the largest compensation components, such as salary, bonus, and equity, to rank individuals and equity off executive officers. Okay. And then uh, I, I suggest you determine ranges for the smaller compensation components. So, for example, if relocation never exceeds 35000 and housing allowance will never exceed 20000 you take all the top end of the, the ranges there, add them all up, and, uh, and, and see what the maximum differential could be from one executive to another relating to these smaller compensation components. And hey, Mel, um, before, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Mel, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to uh, answer the question that had come in regarding terminated executive officers. The question in particular, before we get too far along and, and don't get a chance to address the topic, but the, the question is talking about in a scenario where you have to include disclosure for up to two additional executive officers who uh, would have otherwise been in the top five, essentially. Um, the question is, is this referring to terminated executive officers who were terminated during the year but may have received separation payment that may have pushed him over as one of the highest paid? Um, it is a part of it. The other part of it is you have to also look at all compensation that was awarded during the calendar year. So where you could see issues in particular is if you gave somebody, say, uh, one scenario could be you give somebody an outsized equity grant, even though that person um, left in, say, you know, August, they received the grant in February, um, you would still have to, to calculate as if that person uh, was employed for the entire calendar year. So you would include that outsized equity grant in February. So it's, it's not just for severance payments, it's, it's for any, really it's any compensation related payments that occurred during the year uh, that would otherwise have been disclosed in the summary comp table. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I wanted to make sure we addressed the question before we move down. Thanks. Oh, no problem. No, no problem, Sven. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, so I, as I was saying, um, uh, rather than collect every uh, perquisite benefit and include it uh, meticulously for each individual, um, uh, which can take a lot of time, uh, I suggest you start with the largest compensation components. And uh, let's say uh, you get your top five and the difference between the top five and uh, the, the fifth rank and the sixth rank is uh, 200,000. Well, if you add the top range of the smaller compensation components and they are less than 200,000, you can stop right there because um, you know, no person has an opportunity to surpass uh, the fifth rank, so you should be all set. Um, if it's if they can, uh, if let's say the sixth rank can exceed with, using perquisites, then you can um, go over the details for that person and see if they uh, they beat the uh, fifth rank uh, to to be in the proxy statement. And this assumes everyone is an executive officer. If you if you have uh, others in there um, that are not, then you would go to the seventh rank, for example, and the eighth. And with that, I'll um, 
turn this over to Sven, who will go over uh, the tabular disclosure summary and, and uh, some other slides. Thanks, Mel. So now, now we've determined our named executive officers, or hypothetically, we've come up with a list um, based on the ranges and tips that Mel had just talked about regarding who the disclosure is for. And that, that is kind of half the battle. Um, I, uh, in terms of from an issuer's perspective or what my approach is for our team, we typically have a NEO list modeled out beginning in our calendar year company, but our NEO list is usually modeled out beginning in April or May. And we then adjust throughout the year as we need to, but r really what that does is it gives us the ability to understand the impact um, for any compensation or equity grants or changes that might occur throughout the year or any new hires or any change in executive officer determination um, gives us the impact to reply pretty quickly um, to whether somebody would be in the proxy or not. Um, and then I've always found that valuable um, from a committee's perspective. The compensation committee is obviously very keen on who disclosure is going to be required for. Also found it valuable for uh, my boss, the CHRO, um, so that she has an ability to understand uh, what the downstream ramifications are. And then also our, our corporate secretary and our general counsel so that they can prepare accordingly. Um, so talking about the actual tabular disclosures, there's, there's a list of tables here and disclosures here that are required. Um, and the, we're not going to get into the nuances of the rules necessarily, but the rule, I do want to highlight that the, the SEC rules are fairly prescriptive on what needs to be included in these tables. Um, there's, there are times where it can be a bit of a gray area, um, but the SEC has issued enough Q&A at this point, and I think there's enough uh, standard practices out there where the tables are fairly well uh, baked in terms of what needs to be included. So if you think about how the, the tables are, are located in the proxy statement or, or how they flow through it, um, at least from the NEO's perspective, it really makes logical sense. So. Initially, you have the summary compensation table, which, which is a snapshot of what was uh, granted or awarded during that calendar year. Um, you then have your grants of plan based awards table, which outlines um, the equity or incentive awards that were made during that calendar year. Then you get into the outstanding equity awards at fiscal year end table, which talks about uh, what is outstanding for the executives. There's a table that is not included on here, which is the pension and um, the non-qual table, um, but that would be next. And then you get into what, from an equity perspective, the options that were exercised and the stock that vested. So if you think about it, it's really the, um, it's kind of a life cycle in terms of, of where the executive is. And then the, the final table, which is the potential payments upon termination or change of control, that really looks at a point in time, specifically the last trading day of the, of the reporting year, um, or the last calendar day of the reporting year, what, what, what would it look like as of that time if certain triggering events occurred, so things like a change of control or termination of employment. So if you flow through the tables, they do make logical sense. Um, additionally, there is a director compensation table, which is, which is really the summary comp table, but applied to the directors, very similar rules there. Um, and then there's, there's additional disclosure regarding securities owned by beneficial owners and management, and then also um, equity compensation plan information. So I, I'm going to talk about the um, summary comp table and the uh, grants plan-based awards table, and then I'll turn it over to Mo, and he'll get into um, the outstanding equity table, and then we'll continue to go from there. Um, so with that, a few tips on the summary compensation table, um, which as I, as I highlighted, is, re is really just a snapshot of what occurred during the calendar year. So just working left to right on the table that's in the presentation, um, the year is pretty straightforward. It is three calendar years. Um, the base salary is pretty straightforward. It's the base salary that's paid during the calendar year, fiscal year. The bonus column, um, that is that is really any discretionary bonus payments that are made. So if you have Discretionary sign-on bonuses, that's a great example of something that would be disclosed in that column, but it's anything that's really not performance-based or not, not based salary. And then in particular for, for our audience today, the, the two that are going to be very meaningful are the, the stock awards column and the options awards column. 
And really what that's getting at is disclosing the grant date fair value of any stock options um, or full value awards, including you know performance share units or whatnot uh, in, in that calendar year. Um, and as the, the first bullet point notes, it's the accounting grant date fair value that's required to be disclosed. Um, so you, you, you do need to reference the actual value, valuation assumptions that you're using, which you typically see in the notes to your 10K. Um, but I, I just want to highlight, I think that's, that's a particular note because if, you've, if you haven't experienced it before or, or if, you, if you start to get questions, oftentimes it, this is where people get a little confused, at least from the executive perspective about what's being disclosed because it doesn't make sense to anybody why you're disclosing the certain numbers. So for example, if you have a performance stock unit or a performance share unit and you have a market-based condition, let's say a, a, a TSR metric or in particular, let's say a relative TSR metric, um, in order to determine the grant aid fair value, you would need to you know, typically run a Monte Carlo simulation. That Monte Carlo simulation, depending on where it comes out, it's not going to equal um, the stock price on the data grant. It's usually going to be a premium or, or it could be less theoretically. Um, and then the same with the option awards. You know, you're going to have your Black-Scholes value and depending on the methodology that you use to convert a grant value amount into the actual number of stock options, um, you can see some disparity between what that grant value is and then what, you know, what the Black-Scholes value is for the accounting, for purposes of the accounting grant date fair value. Um, the only other item that I would highlight really on these two columns other than kind of being aware of of the accounting value and that differential and, and you know the reaction that people can get would be in the uh, performance awards um, you have to include what the maximum amount would be in a footnote so just make sure that you're you're including that relevant information because the column itself is likely just going to be assuming target performance um, if it's you know, liability accounting or, or the Monte Carlo valuation, for example, if it's a market-based condition. So um, you do have to disclose the maximum value. And then the all other comp column can come into play with regard to disclosure of, of equity grants. Um, and you typically would see that in, associated with the termination or a change of control. Um, you would also see it if, if for whatever reason your executives were able to purchase stock at a discount, um, you would disclose what that discount value is. Uh, it's not very common, uh, but it, I did want to highlight that it, they, that table could come into that column could come into play. Um, just continuing on here uh, regarding so if going back to talking about kind of the flows of the tables, so we did our one you know kind of our calendar, your snapshot of everything. What does it look like? That's the summary comp table. Um, the next table that would be in the disclosure is the grants of plan-based awards. And really what the grants of plan-based awards table is intended to do is provide a snapshot of incentive-based and or equity-based awards in more granular detail. So you would include the, uh, the range that could potentially be earned. You would include what the exercise price is for stock options. Um, and then also their uh, kind of the grant date fair value. So just to continue on, um, so the same requirements uh, regarding the grant date fair value determination in the summary compensation table would be required in the grants of plan based awards table. Um, the same requirement that you should footnote any of the award valuation assumptions. This is typically referring back to your uh, notes in your 10K. Um, you would also have the disclosure of the threshold target and maximum payout scenarios for any performance awards. Um, and then if you, you are including a fair market value other than the closing share price on the data grant for the option exercise prices, um, you should include, include a column um, that, that, that does have that. So just to kind of walk through, it, it's, a, it's really a deeper dive into the incentive-based awards, um, including kind of what the range is, what the performance is, and and then also um, some repetitive information and in, in breaking out in, a, in grant level detail uh, what the grant date for value is. 
Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mo, who is going to talk a little bit about the outstanding equity awards of fiscal year end table. Mo? Hey, Sven, let me make some comments on these other two tables first. Um, so uh, many vendors have um, canned reports that will produce this information, um, but I've learned over time never to fully trust those canned reports. And I highly recommend when you're um, calculating these numbers that you attempt to recreate the calculations um, by hand and also uh, try running different reports um, um, and combining them to produce the data and see if they match the canned report. But always, always um, um, test your canned reports because they don't always produce the right information. Um, one example that I've run into were um, market-based PSUs. Um, so the valuation on a market-based PSU doesn't change whether um, a, a target has been met or a maximum has been met for, for uh, accounting purposes, where uh, uh, non-market-based uh, performance conditions will change the, the, the accounting cost. And that's what's reported in the summary comp table and the grant of plan-based awards table. Um, and I found some systems will uh, multiply the fair value on a market-based award by the um, max number of shares vesting, um, the max, um, and uh, that's that's clearly wrong. So always always test your numbers because um, the consequences consequences are pretty grim if you get these this reporting wrong, um, you know, for your annual disclosures. Thanks, thanks, Mo. And then looks like we had another question that just came in regarding the comment on disclosing the discount for any stock purchases in the all other compensation column of the summary compensation table. And the question in particular relates to what if you have an employee stock purchase plan? Um, the SEC has said that if the benefit is broadly available to share it to your employees, which in an employee stock purchase plan it, it is, that no, you are not required to disclose um, what that discount is in the elder comp table. Okay, so we'll move on to the um, outstanding equity awards at fiscal year end table. This, re this table represents a shift from the uh, summary comp and grant of plan based awards in that we're no longer looking at the accounting cost of awards um, for, the, uh, for the company. Uh, and instead, we're looking at the intrinsic value of awards held by the, the uh, named executive officers. The, the data represents grant level quantity outstanding um, at fiscal year end. For most people, fiscal year end is uh, December 31st, 2018. And uh, intrinsic values are disclosed for each grant and are calculated using the fair market value as of the last trading day of the fiscal year. So this year, that would be the closing market price of your company stock on December 31st, which is a Monday, um, if, if, you, if that is, represents the end of your fiscal year. So this is um, the way the, ta the columns are titled, I, I think, in my opinion, are not that intuitive. So, you know, uh, for me, I, all awards come out of an equity incentive plan but they seem to use that terminology in this table to differentiate performance-based awards from um, um, service uh, awards that just need to meet service requirements. So um, the columns that don't have the words equity incentive plan awards um, in front of them in, in the header um, are for standard stock options and full value share awards that only include service conditions. And the ones that do have that um, are specifically talking about performance-based stock option awards and performance uh, stock units and, and uh, PSAs as well. So um, another thing is that uh, once performance conditions are satisfied on an award, uh, it will move over from the performance-based columns uh, over to the uh, service-based condition columns. So you can have something that started out as, as a PSU, but now you're, not, you're no longer reporting it uh, in the equity incentive plan awards columns and instead reporting it in the other columns. And Mo, just also, to build on that a little bit. Go ahead. Um, sure. Sorry, just to build on that a little bit, because I think there's two, two different types of designs that are fairly common on performance share units. The first is 
The performance share units vest as of the date of the committee's certi compensation committee's certification or, or you know, some other date that the committee specifies. But it's really a discretionary date. So you, you could have a situation, and I'll talk a little bit about this in the, in the next table, but you could have a situation where the committee has determined performance for the calendar year, it's typically done in February. Um, you don't you don't really need um, you don't really need to worry about that in the outstanding equity awards table in that scenario to most point um, because the the committee would have taken action to vest the grant. But the other type of design, and this is the type of design that we actually have at TransUnion, is you have the performance period, which say runs three calendar years, so January one until December thirty one of uh, two years later. Um, but then there's an additional kind of stub requirement where you have to be employed as of a certain day. So in our case, it's, it's mid-February of the following year in order to receive the PSU. That type of design is exactly what Mo was talking about, where you're going to be in a situation uh, where the performance has been certified um, in, say, January or early February. But, but at that point, the executive has not yet invested in those grants. And so, as a result, you're not going to disclose those in, in the you know, options exercise invested table. You're going to continue to disclose those awards in the outstanding equity awards table, but you're going to move them in, into the column that Noel was just talking about. Okay. Um, well, we just sort of interrupt one more time here, uh, and then I'll turn it back over to you. But we did receive another question on explaining what the ASC 718 grant fair value is for the SC for the summary compensation table on performance-based awards. Yeah, um, it's 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 again it's the accounting grant date fair value. So if you if you were to say we'll break it down really quickly, let's assume you had a performance share unit grant that was based on 50% revenue performance of the company and 50% of a market-based condition, so like a TSR. What you would do is the, uh, in that scenario, the revenue metric would just simply be the closing share price on the data grant, multiplied by the number of performance share units that would be subject to that. And then for the other 50% on the market-based condition, you would do whatever the, either Monte Carlo valuation or other valuation that you would be running to determine that value, you would calculate that and you would add the two together. So it, it's really uh, dependent on determining the grant date for value is really dependent on what the underlying performance metrics are for the performance share unit. Um, and, and I would highly recommend um, ensuring that your accounting, your either finance or accounting group is, is aware of this. I mean, they're going to have those valuations. That's where it, that's going to be the source of everything. Um, and you should definitely make sure that they agree with whatever calculations you end up with. So back to you, Mo. Sure. So uh, just to finish up the discussion on the Outstanding Equity Awards at fiscal year end table, um, uh, th there's many like nuances, little small rules that you need to apply to this table. And, and at the end of this presentation, we'll share some great resources for that. But one thing that always comes up is you, sometimes you have an executive leave the company uh, in the middle of the year and all their awards are either fully exercised or forfeited or expired. and and they'll, they won't have any outstanding awards. So um, the, the trend that I see is that you always include a row for each named executive officer, even if they have no outstanding awards. And then you would just footnote uh, why they have no outstanding awards. And uh, if, if you are um, drafting the tables in like a word processing software, this is actually a great tip because the last thing you want to do is leave someone out and then they send it back to you and you have to then play around with the formatting again. I think that's one of the greatest pains actually of preparing the proxy is dealing with formatting in a, uh, in a word processing software. So um, uh, perform, um, valuing performing conditions, performance uh, based awards, excuse me, um, in the outstanding equity awards table can be a little bit tricky. So I created a little slide to just go over it in a high level. Um, so, uh, generally, the values calculated for performance awards um, are, are based on achievement of threshold goals, unless uh, um, if the award provides for a single estimated payment payout, 
the amount should be that amount should be reported. Uh, so if you have what what we call a light switch plan, um, you know you have a performance target and the performance target either is met at 100% target or if the target is not met, there's a zero payout. That's the value you would use. Also, um, if uh, you you do have threshold and uh, target and max performance or some variation of that, and in the prior fiscal years performance exceeded threshold, you would calculate the value assuming the next level of performance has been met. So if last year target performance was met um, and your next level of performance is maximum, you would value um, the award in the outstanding table um, based on intrinsic value on the maximum number of shares. Um, Mo, we also received a question regarding uh, performance awards and in particular, the question was on, it says on slide 12, regarding the comments on performance awards reporting under the equity plan, equity incentive plan awards column or not, do we really need to report them on different columns based on the performance conditions being met? Um, how can we So I, I would say no. I would say no, yeah, that, 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 that is not an option. You have to move it from the equity incentive plan awards column over to the um, service-based columns. Um, I mean, I've, I've read this rule over and over again. Go ahead, you wanna add something? And yeah, I do. I think it's fairly easy to know whether the, the performance has been met. It's, it's, and just to be clear, that typically is certified by the compensation committee. You don't, it's not, it's not incumbent upon um, any equity plan administrator to forecast out where the company is um, or what the financials are projected to be or are or think they are. You really look to whether the committee certification has occurred or not to determine whether or not the performance has been achieved. There's no, there's no projection so, there. It's a, very, it's a very black or white approach. Yeah, the, the, so this um, uh, person is actually uh, concerned about the way the numbers are represented in the canned um, service provider report from the plan administration system. So uh, their concern is that the numbers are being reported in that canned report in the performance-based columns, so they don't want to go through the trouble of moving that number over. But this is exactly my point earlier about how you cannot trust a canned report uh, there's no one-click solution for the proxy statement. You can never trust the canned report. You should always run other reports to validate the data. You should do hand calculations. When preparing these tables, you should have significant backup and provide that to a second person to review your work because there are no shortcuts when doing the proxy statement. Anything wrong in the proxy statement uh, has, has uh, oftentimes resulted in lawsuits um, um, historically. And uh, okay. with that, I'll be turning it uh, turning it over to you, Sven, for the options exercise and stock vested table. Thanks, Mel. So just just kind of continuing on in the evolution of the tables, um, we talked about the summary count table. That is a snapshot of everything that occurred during the during the fiscal year. We talked about the grants of plan based awards table. That gets into more granularity about the incentive awards, the inequity awards that were granted during the year. Um, then Mo talked about the outstanding equity awards table, which is really looking at uh, what does the executive named executive officer have outstanding as of the last day of the calendar year, including any performance-based awards and whatnot. Um, so then the kind of the final piece of this is really what actually vested during the calendar year or the stock options that were exercised during the calendar year. Um, I would say of all the tables, this is probably the most straightforward. Um, uh, there's maybe one or two little tidbits that I'll, that I'll highlight that isn't on the slide that you might want to be aware of. But just in general, this is, this is really looking at the value that was delivered to the executive. So you have um, four columns here, one for stock, um, two for stock options, two for stock awards, um, which both reflect the number and then the amount. Um, and you really do use a straightforward intrinsic value calculation 
so there's really no accounting rule. It's just whatever the uh, fair market value is as of the date of vesting, um, the fair market value being the stock price of the, the underlying equity. So it's, it's simply just the intrinsic value on the date of vesting or date of exercise. Um, for stock options, just to be clear, it's simply the intrinsic value on the date of exercise. Um, so you don't ever have to get into the sale of subsequent shares for any reason. Um, the easiest way to think about it is, is it's W-2 income. So what, what W-2 income did the employee recognize for exercising their stock options um, or vesting in any stock awards? Um, the, the only kind of nuanced thing um, that I would that I would highlight is the situation where you do have um, uh, committee certification that occurs. So going back to that design on performance share units, but you have a committee certification that, that occurs after year end. So let's say your calendar, your company, your compensation committee certifies performance in, in February of the following year, which is pretty common. Um, the executives have asked at the time of certification. Um, so you would, in that in that case, there's been some informal guidance by the SEC that says you would just really look to um, to determine to calculate the performance share units. You'd really just look to the share prices of the last day of the calendar year, and then you would multiply that by the number of shares that they actually are going to vest in at the time of certification. So it's a it's a little bit of a nuance, but um, I did want to highlight that. Um, and then just be aware if there if there are any any uh, the deferrals as well. So there is a requirement that you still have to disclose what was deferred, but um, just, just highlight that, that it, it does exist. Um, that's it on the on the table or the tabular disclosure section. Although the uh, the next slide I'm going to talk about the potential payments upon termination and change of control um, is probably best disclosed in a tabular format. It is not required by the FCC to be in a tabular format. Um, the, all the tables that we just talked about, if you go dig into the FCC rules, you'll see that the FCC actually embeds the table in the rule and is pretty particular about what needs to be disclosed. Um, so, so with that, just to kind of continue on the evolution, talked about, um, you know, all of the tables and kind of the life cycle of equity awards and what needs to be disclosed. The, ne the final table in the executive, the name of the executive officer section, um, is going to be the, uh, and I'm going to pause for one second here. We just got another question. It says, do the shares need to be released first to be included in the value realized on vesting? Um, there's no, Mo, and chime in if you disagree with me on this, but there is no requirement that the, um, that the share actually um, be distributed. It's it's really you you really have to look at the timing of taxation. Um, so, in the case so if of there, you, go ahead, if there are deferrals, you disclose the value of the amounts deferred, and include terms and details in the footnote. So, mm -hmm. if, if something vested and you haven't released it, um, you still would include it in the options exercise and stock vested table. Not only that, uh, you would also include that award. And, and Sven, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you would also include it in the non-qualified deferred compensation table, which uh, yeah, did not include in this they would pick it up. Yeah, and yeah. One, so one, just to, and, and one, here's an example of, I think, I think this is going to help um, answer the question, but just an example would be, let's say you had a restricted stock grant that vested on December 31, um, even though the underlying shares aren't going to be released until the following date in you know the following calendar year, the taxable event occurred in on December 31, and so that's the using the closing share price or whatever methodology you would use. That that's what you would disclose in that scenario. So even though the executive doesn't get the shares until a few days later, or they're not deposited in the individual brokerage account, and there's some sort of an administrative lag, that doesn't really matter. It's really it's really getting at W-2 amounts uh, as to what needs to be included in the column. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, so just to, just to revert and back. The, to what, what, what we mean by that is the Medicare wages column in the W, the, the Medicare wages section, not the box one wages. So even in a deferral, it, it should match the box five. I think that's Medicare. I don't know if my Medicare is back box three or box five, one of those two. Go ahead, uh, sorry. 
Thanks, Mel. Um, just to continue on, so the potential payments upon termination and change of control, this I would say is probably one of the, the most complicated areas where the SEC has a bit more of a principle-based disclosure approach as opposed to a very prescriptive approach. So you see, you see organizations handle these tables differently or handle this disclosure differently. Um, and, and I would say here you're, you're, you're really getting at what is contractually in place if certain triggering events happen as of the last day of the, of the calendar year or the reporting year. Um, and, and so you're going to see a whole bunch of scenarios, um, in particular, as far as the equity is concerned, what you're going to want to pay attention to is the intrinsic value. You're not going to get into any sort of accounting values or a anything related to um, any sort of valuation. It, it, it's literally just what the executive would get on an intrinsic basis if the triggering event occurred on the last day of the, of the reporting year. Um, so just to, just to highlight here for stock options, uh, you would use the intrinsic value. So the difference between the last trading day of the reporting year and the underlying exercise price of the stock option. And then for any full value awards like restricted stock units or performance share units, um, you would just use the number multiplied by the, the share price on the last day of the, the last trading day of the year. Um, I would say in terms of complexity, these tables can arguably, or this disclosure can arguably be the most complex. Uh, there's been an evolution, I would say, over a number of years from when the disclosure rules first came out towards simplification in this area. Um, and you do see some organizations that want to address the requirements by purely using a narrative as opposed to any tabular disclosure. But I think the common practice is to include tables um, and to really try and explain it in the most simplistic manner. Because this, this again, this is a very, very complex disclosure that is very time consuming. And Mo will, just a preview of coming attractions, but you know, Mo will get into a bit of a timeline. So that's really all I'm going to say on the, the potential payments upon termination and change of control. Um, make sure you, you look at the terms and conditions of any employment agreements, grant agreements, omnibus incentive plans, or bonus plans. Um, and in terms of equity, just, just be aware that you're using a straight intrinsic value calculation. Um, so, so with that, I'll turn it over. Go ahead. Um, just a, an, an additional comment on this slide, Sven. If, if your um, equity uh, plan or if your compensation um, uh, philosophy adjust compensation if um, an executive hits a, a golden parachute um, uh, payment um, and, and gets some kind of excise tax, excise ta tax. If you gross it up or if you reduce the compensation so that they don't hit any 280G limits, uh, which is the the code on uh, golden parachute payments. Uh, that's quite an involved process and it's a very technical calculation to see if someone hit the 280G payment, you'll probably need an outside consultant for that. Um, so just be prepared and, and look out for those rules in, in your uh, employment agreements or equity plans or um, so on and so forth so that you can be uh, well prepared for it. Thanks, Mel. Um, the next table, uh, so now we've, we're, we've completed really our disclosure requirements on our, on our executive officers. So the next table, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, um, but the, the next table is going to be the, that we're talking about is going to be the director's compensation table. And, and really this is simply a, the summary, the easiest way to think about it is it's the summary compensation table for your directors. So you would disclose any retainer fees, any cash fees, any committee fees. Um, and then you would also disclose in a similar manner to the summary compensation table, the grant date fair value of any stock awards that your directors get. I will say usually you don't see performance-based awards um, made to directors. It's very common to see simply time-based awards. So you're not, you're not going to likely get into a lot of the complexities here. Um, but this does include anybody who served on the board of directors at any time during the last fiscal year. Um, and it, it's a it's a pretty straightforward disclosure. So that's that's really all I'll say on it. Uh, now I'm gonna 
turn it back over to Mo, who's going to talk a little bit about our the security ownership of beneficial owners um, and management. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Ben. So we have about 10 minutes left and quite a few slides to cover. So I'm just going to go over this very quickly. Um, so where um, so the security ownership benefit, uh, beneficial ownership table. This is um, this includes total shares held plus outstanding exercisable options plus vested deferred full value share awards plus any awards scheduled to vest within 60 days following the proxy date. Um, uh, um, following the proxy record date. So all the outstanding shares as of the record date plus anything vesting or or will represent uh, sort of like a controlling interest by the uh, executive or other beneficial owner um, uh, as of as of the record date. Okay. Uh, other beneficial owners uh, list is usually not populated by the stock fund manager, but if requested, if you're requested to populate it, you can refer to the company's Schedule 13G and 13D filings available on sec.gov for information on 5% stockholders and forms 345 for 10% stockholders. And I'm just going to quickly move to the next slide so we can uh, get to the meat of this presentation. Um, okay, so uh, I think the last sort of tab quasi tabular disclosure we'll be going over is the equity uh, compensation plan information table. Now, uh, th this table le lists each equity plan uh, for which there are outstanding awards or shares remaining available for issuance. And uh, the one thing I'd like to note is that the weighted average exercise price excludes full value share awards from the equation. So uh, while the number of uh, securities to be issued would include RSUs, the weighted average exercise price would not uh, include it. So your, denom your denominator for that will be will be different. Okay. Um, table. Th this table must be included in the proxy statement in years when a compensation plan is being submitted for uh, shareholder approval. Otherwise, you may f you you may include it in the 10K, and you may actually often find it there as well. Okay. Uh, and also equity plans intended to qualify as retirement plans, such as ESOPs and 401k plans that allow purchases of company stock do not need to be included in this list. Uh, employee stock purchase plans uh, are not retirement plans and, and they should be included, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna move over to a, a project timeline. So we went over quite a few tables here and as you can imagine, it would be a daunting, it's a daunting task to, to compile information for all of them. So almost to the point where you never know where you should start. So we want to help you out here and, um, and, and, and go over that with you on, on our project timeline. Okay. So as Sven mentioned earlier, the potential payments table is probably one of the most complex tables uh, to populate. And the thing about that table is the terms, they change slowly, the, uh, the terms and conditions that impact that table, because they're really driven by employment agreements, um, terms and conditions in your equity plan document, terms and conditions in your option agreement, things like changing control provisions, employment agreements uh, will usually include um, severance arrangements and, and other benefits like outplacement services. Um, so you don't want to, um, although this table is listed last in the proxy statement, um, you don't want to uh, wait, you know, you don't want to do it last and find that uh, a bunch of employment agreements have changed or, um, you know, um, the plan document has been amended and now you have no precedent to rely on the calculations and you're sitting there reading um, a bunch of uh, documents trying to figure out how to calculate things in the event of a termination, in the event of a change in control, an event of a change in control combined with a termination. Um, so it can get, it can, it can be very cumbersome and you want to have your questions ready for legal counsel and anyone else in the beginning of the, uh, in, in, you know, d during uh, low, low times, um, outside of peak times during the year is what I'm trying to say. Uh, another thing that companies really care about is they'll they'll want to know 
if someone is going to breach that fifth rank and become an NEO for the year. Um, so that is another thing that is commonly tracked throughout the year. So that would be in, uh, in the beginning here, okay? Also, so, and, and then next, uh, towards year end, you could begin working on uh, the director's compensation, the summary comp, and the grants of plan-based awards table. Towards year end is when you'll have your NEO determinations done. And these tables um, include the fair value, the accounting value of different compensation components. So uh, you don't really um, uh, need to wait to the last day of the year to do them. Next, uh, shortly after year end, that's when you'll have your price for the last trading day of the year and you can then prepare your outstanding equity awards at fiscal year end and option exercises and stock vested table. Well, uh, shortly after year end, you should have done your uh, share pool reconciliation, which would uh, help you then prepare your equity compensation plan information table. Then near the record date, um, that's when you'll work on your securities ownership of certain beneficial owners, since that uh, looks at beneficial ownership as of the record date and 60 days after the record date. And on that, we'll uh, move to questions because we only have a few minutes left. Um, thanks, Melon. Just to comment on one of the questions that has come in, it says, please comment on the part of the rule that says ESPP has to be included in the, in the equity plan table. Um, just to give you the citation, it's, it's I believe it's item 201D of Regulation SK in the SEC rules. Um, that really talks about the equity compensation plan information. And uh, yeah, you typically do. It's re it's really because the, the ESPP has to be approved by shareholders um, to be qualified, I believe. Uh, you, do, you do need to include it in the equity plan information section. Um, I would say if you if you have a specific nuance or a specific question for why you should exclude it, my recommendation would be just to talk to either your internal counsel or get get thoughts from external counsel. But but my experience has typically been to include it. And again, it's item 201D um, of Regulation SK is the actual citation. Uh, and then uh, I think we're pausing I had for this questions. But Go ahead. Sure. I also had that same question one time, and I had I remember this was years ago, and um, I had to do some digging, and I actually found the question answer on the SEC website. I can't cite it right now off the top of my head, but it did confirm um, that the the ESBP plan should be included, and we could send the uh, whoever the requester uh, a citation after the call. Uh, I'll look it up. I'll try to find it again. Yeah, and just to build on that, there, uh, the current slide just illustrates some proxy resources that we found helpful. Um, so you, you know, you can you can typically find these via Google. I do know a subscription is required for compensation standards. Um, I, I would say, in my opinion, it's well worth the money uh, to subscribe to compensation standards. Mark Borges and his team just really do a fantastic job of thinking about the nuanced situations, and you can get access to uh, Mark's disclosure treatise, which is very helpful. Um, also, there's a, a disclosure, exact comp disclosure handbook that Gibson Dunn has put out um, in connection with Willis Tars Watson. That's very helpful as well. Um, and then if you wanted to get the actual citations of what we were talking about regarding the exact comp disclosures, you can see that it's item 402 of Regulation SK and the stock the security stock ownership disclosures are 403 and then the equity comp plan info is, is item 201. Um, so with that, looks like we have about a minute left. Um, go, go ahead, so, Mel. Take a look at our contact information, add us on LinkedIn. Uh, we, we really enjoyed presenting to you and, and thank you for joining us. Great, thanks so much. Um, thank you, Mo and Sven, um, who joined us, and thank all of you for attending today's educational webcast. Please do look for an email in the next few days with links to the recording and materials for this session. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.